Hey everyone, what's up? My name is Jeanette, also known as Misfit Vegan. And today I have a very amazing, true pioneer as my guest. I have Gabriel Cousins, who, you know, he is someone who is truly one of the people that have pushed the living foods movement uh, in this world. And so I'm so honored to have him. I think he's written nine books. I think nine. Oh, 13 13 books, including Conscious Eating, which is a a book that really changed my life. Also, there's A Cure for Diabetes and many other books, Uh, Conscious Parenting as well. Um, And he became a vegetarian at age 30. And he just turned 80 this year. Um, And so I have a lot of questions for him. But before we get started, he's going to lead us in a dance and a special meditation. So first of all, Gabriel, thank you so much for joining me. And I'll let you uh, start the show. You know, it's my joy. I just really want to support the kind of live food vegan energy because it works. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do is focus on spiritual joy. And when we dance, and we'll dance for about three minutes, and I hope everybody joins me in dancing because it's ecstatic dancing. And then we will uh, do a little meditation just for a few minutes just to get focused. I'm just going to mention about the meditation. Um, It's called a Shaktipat meditation or Haniha. So the energy comes through my eyes and can awaken the energy, the spiritual energy, known also as kundalini, uh, or the Raha Kadesh. So just so people know it, it's like a a warning. (laughs) I guess you can call it a warning. But you understand what I'm saying, is that uh, that way people know that there's energy happening. So let's all dance. I'm just taking my shirt off for a second. It's a little warm here, here in Israel, at eight in the nine o'clock at night, it's still warm. So let me do this. Let me get this picture going. Oh, so we have you, and then I need me so you can see me dancing. Good. So let's go. Here we go. So I'll go ahead with the music.
Now, just focus on my eyes. Let the energy go through or meditate for about three minutes. Here we go. You now in the meditation. Yo, slowly come out of meditation. And now we're ready for any questions. Wow. That was such a treat. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love the wow. dance. It's really fun, you know, so it's good. Wow, that was amazing. Amazing. I don't know too many 80 year olds that can move like that. I don't know any. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to come back to earth now. And uh, 
Okay. So my first question for you, and this is such an honor for me to speak with you. So thank you for making the time. So my first question to you is, um, what was the shift that occurred in your life uh, when you were awakened to the fact that we are supposed to be eating fresh, uh, raw living foods? What, what happened in your life and what was the shift that occurred? <laughs> it, it was actually quite interesting. Uh, my wife was pregnant um, and uh, <clears throat> a few months pregnant, and we both had this nightmare, okay? What was the nightmare? That somehow we're eating the fetus. And that's it. Became vegan. That was the one, one overnight conversion. You both had the same nightmare? Yes. Whoa. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So we take okay. that, took that as a message, right? <laughs> you know, really. Wow. Um, and so what um what year was that? Because I know you went vegetarian in um when you were 30 in the 70s. Yeah, it was in the early 70s. Yes, yes. It was 1973. Okay. And um, how did you discover raw foods? How did you discover this this living food lifestyle? Well, in 1975, um, I was uh, doing a lot of meditating. I was living uh, uh, partly in India. And um, I received what we call Shakti Pot from Swami Mukhananda. I kind of went into the nothing. I kind of disappeared. And then as I came back, a little message rang out, which said, you should learn to eat and live in a way that supports the spiritual energy or the kundalini. That's it. Okay. So it began to consolidate into learning how to do this. In those times, there wasn't a lot of information about this kind of thing. So uh, I was the, a doctor in, in the ashram was a few thousand people. And I get to see how it worked and help people make that transition in a, in a healthy way. You can do it in an unhealthy way too, but that's not the idea. You know? Yes, I would love to elaborate on that. Um, transitioning from a meat and dairy and processed food diet to a living food diet. Uh, what are some of your best tips and tricks on the, the transition period? Sure. So um, it, it, it took me a few years, okay? It was vegan immediately, okay? But then to kind of see that transition uh, to 100% live food actually took a little bit of time. Uh, I would say to 1982. So, you know, and that the key determinant was how do you keep your full energy and vitality and still do this. <laughs> and so I explored. And one of the first things I learned is we're all unique. We aren't a bunch of cows who just eat grass. So um, I had to see my uniqueness in that process. Um, and it took a while to work that out because nobody had actually talked about it. So I'll give an example. Um, so in my, my 60s, I was doing 25 pull-ups every few days, you know, pull-ups like that. And I, I was stuck. I wasn't progressing. I know that's a lot for most people. I understand that. But I made, I just had an insight that at age 60, 65 really, I had to have slightly more protein. I took one tablespoon more of E3 Live a day, one tablespoon. And within a month, I hit 100 pull-ups on a regular basis. Now, one tablespoon. So what we're looking at is we have to be very thoughtful about the adjustments we're making and observe how it sustains energy. And I think that's the key. So you have to become your own healer at a certain point. Okay, it's enough to know vegan, but now vegan, then live food, and then how do you work that? And it turns out about 
30% of the population needs uh, a lower protein diet, which is pretty much what I was on. Uh, maybe uh, 8% protein. I moved it to about 12% protein. That's all I did. And then 70% needs a slightly higher protein, like 70 grams. Still low in conventional lack of wisdom today, but there's a range there, okay? So I basically explored to have optimum vitality and strength and steady energy throughout the day. So I'm also looking at endurance, strength, steadiness, focusing of mind. So all those things had to be working for it to, to kind of be the uh, kind of optimum diet. So I'm, that's what I did. I looked at those things. I made the slight adjustments, slight adjustments until I find where I am now. And that's really it. It was trial and error with some idea of where we start. Now on my website, I have a little 30 questionnaire, you know, that help people decide whether they're a uh, fast oxidizer, a person needs more protein and fat, or a slower oxidizer, a person needs a little bit more carbohydrate and less protein and fat. Because those are the big dividers as to what you need to do. I'm a person that doesn't need a whole lot of protein, but I need more than 8%, I needed 12%. And so it's that little shifting, but that's what you have to pay attention is what it really amounts to. Mm. And I'll leave the link below for everyone to go to your website. And um, wow, I love that you talked about being your own healer. Um, you know, a lot of people are looking at like people like you and looking exactly what you do and they want to do what you do or what, you know, this person does um, now. So you mentioned E3 Live, which for some of some people that don't know, that is a blue green algae. And so now what are some other things There's that you think it's Klamath Lake? It's the only place in the world that happens. It's a mm. It's not like spirulina, which you can kind of grow anywhere. Go ahead. Yeah. No. So I'm. Uh, I haven't heard E3 live in years. I haven't thought about it in years. It's funny. Um, but I used to take it a lot. Uh, so now, what are some other things that you think are very, very important? Or let's just talk about you. What are some very important foods that you consume? So I'm going to go back to the E3 Live for a moment. Yes, please. It's good. So I, I began researching E3 Live in 1982. And I actually went up to Klamath Lake. I saw how it was grown. I saw it was really pure and clear. And for reasons, it, it's like a volcanic lake. So it was very clear that it was a very, very high energy food. So one of the things I'm looking at is high energy foods with the least amount of intake that I need to have. That's that's kind of the, the key to understand that. So um, I, I also did a lot of research on it because to me, it's very important to keep up the mental functioning. And I hate to admit it, but I've noticed a fair amount of vegans who have been vegan for a while, their mental functioning is not at the top anymore you're you you agree with that you, you, yes so my thing is okay that's an issue then let's address it and e3 live is more specific for brain function than spirulina or chlorella so i tend to go that way because i say well gee you know we show it actually increases your iq in, in indonesia they did a study with the E3 Live and, and you know, with uh, high school kids and increase their IQ by eight points in three months. But that's a very significant statement. Okay. So I'm looking at that. I also did research with E3 Live with people, uh, you know, of, of age, I guess we'll call it, who, whose mental function was going down. And within six months of taking at two tablespoons a day, there was an increase in mental function. Now, what do I mean mental functioning? I'm talking about people that can't even dress themselves, okay? 
being able after three months to be able to dress themselves, exercise and take care of themselves. That's dramatically important. So uh, so we we got a, a vegan product that actually increases your mental functioning more, as well as being a, a high protein concentrate, 60, 65% protein. So that, so that actually is high on the list. Now, um, I, I point that out because we, we want to be very detailed in what we're doing because we don't, we're not eating that much. Okay. So I mostly have, and my diet is sprouts and vegetables. It's raw. And uh, some fermented food like the sauerkraut because you want that for your uh, internal digestive processes and a certain amount of nuts and seeds that are soaked. So when you're soaking them, you're drawing out the different toxins and you're hydrating them. So they're, they're more enzymatically active. So when we look at that, I just describe my diet, lots and lots of sprouts, a certain amount of nuts and seeds that are soaked, the blue-green algae. And I also have avocado because you need a certain amount of fat, like a half an avocado, depending on the avocado size, a half an avocado a day. Uh, and that's it. I don't eat a lot. So when I say that, I just have one meal a day. Um, now, I didn't start at one meal a day. But it's evolved that way. You know, we're, we're programmed. Oh, you should have three meals a day. No, no, no. no I basically found that if, uh, eating somewhere around noon to two o'clock, it, it kind of goes optimal for me. And then I, you know, have water or, or some liquids or something in the later afternoon because you want to keep hydrated as well. So hydration is a big deal. How do you know if you're hydrated? Well, the way you know you're hydrated is you, you should be urinating every one to two hours. It's a very, very simple way of doing it. You're not measuring your skin to see how that is. It's like if you aren't urinating every two hours, you're not hydrated. And so it's simple for people to follow. You know, so I, I'm looking, look, as I teach people, I look at, make it simple. So those are kind of the, the basic diet. Now, other I have a little bit of fruit, blueberries and bilberries, uh, and some cherries, uh, but it's not a major part of my diet. Now, there are some people who do better with just fruit. I think there are small, once we get away from a philosophy and look at what works, uh, I think you're looking at 2% of the population that can be you know, fruitarian. Now, I, I was a fruitarian for two years, um, but I'm measuring what's your strength, what's your, what's your concentration, what's your, you know, your, your consistency. And even though I did okay, it was no, nowhere near as powerful as this, Blue green algae and nut seeds and you know a vegetable type uh, of a diet with me for with a few bilberries and blueberries. So, so that's do how, you? Oh, thank you for going through that. So now, do you think because you said yeah, two percent of the population maybe can be fruitarian? Uh, what do you think is the optimal diet for most of the population? Do you think that they should eat um, you know one meal a day like you? Uh, how do you think that they should be eating? Most people. Well, you have to start where you're where you're at. Okay. So my journey began a while, 50 years ago with all this. Okay. So I didn't start as a live food vegan year one. I didn't even know the concept, to be honest with you. Okay. I just looked at, okay, we now we're going to be vegan. What does that mean? And I kind of worked the diet out a little bit from there. And then in meditation, I was guided to, okay, now you're talking about at least 80% live food, vegan. And, you know, 
<laughs> over that period of time, seven, eight years later, then I had reached a place of uh, you know, 100% vegan, uh, live food. So that's the, the, it's an evolution. And then you have to see whether you're a person that needs more protein and fat in your diet and less carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate, or just the opposite. More complex carbohydrate and less protein and fat. So there's trial and error. And I, I want to emphasize that because I, I do not recommend just getting it from a book. Okay, as you you mentioned already, yeah, see, all that's important. Read the books, see the input. Yeah, but you have to figure it out. Yeah, I, I totally agree because you know I came to this lifestyle and I was uh, just following everyone blindly, you know, and um, it didn't work out because what works for one person is not going to work for the other. So this is great advice. And now, so can you please tell uh, my followers? What is, can you explain the energetic difference between cooked food and raw food? Because it seems that most of the population is still eating cooked food, which is crazy to me and probably maybe you like doing this for so long, but most people are still eating cooked food. So could you explain why, why even eat living raw foods? What is the difference? So I'm going to use three terms. Cook food, raw food, and living food. Okay, just to be super clear. Cook food, you coagulate 50, 60% of the protein, 60 to 70% of the vitamins and minerals are lost, and the micronutrients up to 95%. So it's significantly less energy because I, I write my book about the subtle organizing energy field, which is the end. When you do a career in photography, you, you see a picture of an energy field, okay? Well, when you cook it, that energy field goes to about zero. Okay, so you have the, I'm gonna call it an aura. That's a term people are more familiar with. It's more than an aura, but so you have the aura and then you lose 50% of the protein. That's not very helpful because you have to eat twice as much food to do that. And as I say, 67% of vitamins and minerals and 95% of the phytonutrients. Okay, so that's what happens when you cook the food. Now, raw is the next step. That's food that's been picked, but it's been around for at least three days. Because when we looked at things with Karelian photography, which is how we kind of got some clarity here, in about three days, a significant amount of energy gets lost. Okay. Now, live food is when it's fresh. You're eating it fresh. It's freshly picked. It's grown, you know, and you're harvesting it within 24 hours. It's going to maintain a certain it's high force energy for at least 24 hours. Okay, so that's the difference between live food and raw food. Raw food is still very, very good. And for most people, that's what people can get. So that's good. But you want to get it as freshly picked as possible. So we, I mean, we're working on our own food growing situation. Um, but nearby where we live, there's a huge organic farm, a guy from Switzerland, and we can get what I call live food every day. So obviously that's a plus for what we've chosen to live. So it's fresh. He and he delivers it every day. He only delivers it to two places in, in Israel. One is 10 minutes from our house and the other is you know, where we used to get it where i used to so those are the kind of things that i think are we're doing you know find a farmer who understands a little bit about fresh organic food because organic's important too because um really organic has a whole lot more phytonutrients and antioxidants all of which are uh commercial isn't so good with 
So, you know, you want organic, you want live, you want well hydrated, and you want as fresh as possible, particularly, you know, one to two days uh, after it's been picked. So those are kind of the criteria that I use, plus I mentioned about the hydration, because if you're not hydrated, your brain is not going to work so well, because the brain cells actually shrink, okay? Seriously, your brain shrinks. And you want to keep hydrated so your brain isn't shrinking. And, and it, one of the things that I've seen in some of the, uh, not live food, but vegan uh, people talking about things without mentioning names, is, is that clearly there's kind of a shrinkage. Okay. I'm actually taller now than. I was actually as a football player when I was 20. I'm actually taller. How did that happen? Well, because I'm hydrating, you know, and I'm lengthening. So we're, we're, we're not wearing out the cartilage. We're building the cartilage because we make our own cartilage if you, if you kind of do it right. So um, that's important. I mean, people just assume... You get older, weaker, less flexible, you know, less clear, you know, with age. And so that's, it's a paradigm shift, right? It's like, no, you can get stronger. I mean, when I was a captain of an undefeated football team, it was college football team, National Football Hall of Fame, I could do 60 push-ups, which is more than anybody else could do. And so today I... I haven't been doing it as much, but I, I, I had 1,400 push-ups. I've made up the 2,000. That's what I'm saying. So I, I have to push up. Now, what you learn is you got to be consistent. You got to work really hard at it. If you're going to uh, show the rules of expectations of what people think uh, aren't really true. If you don't exercise... If you don't breathe, if you don't do, I do yoga as well. My wife's a yoga teacher. You know, if you're not doing yoga for stretching, well, you guess what? You're going to contract. And by the time people are 70 years old, they haven't been doing what we call in yoga pranayama, breathing exercises. They lose 50, they have lost 50% of their lung capacity. Well, that's huge. So once you get the paradigm, you shift it back to, no, no, I'm going to get stronger, more flexible, and, and improve lung capacity with age. That's a paradigm shift. But that's what we're talking about. Because it's possible. Yes. I love it. I love it. Um, yoga is very powerful. And I want to talk more about yoga. But... I know my followers are going to ask me, so I have to ask you. Uh, so, yes. So you mentioned you don't eat a lot of fruit and they're going to ask me. So can you please tell us um, why? Why do you feel fruit is not part of a healthy raw food diet? Um, and and um, can you just touch upon like your your views on fruit? OK, so first of all, I didn't say eating food is not healthy. OK, OK. Um, I eat the bilberries and the blueberries and, and cherries. Okay. And, uh, so I do have a certain amount of fruit. Um, the downside of fruit is really more a, a warning for, for uh, fruitarians is you don't get uh, very, as much nutrition. So unless you're metabolically very shifted to one side of things, okay, you actually get deficient. And I've seen enough fruitarians have trouble with that. So that's why I go easy with it. So I think a certain amount of fruit in the diet is great. Um, we, so I'm going to leave it like that. We can have 15 to 25 uh, grams of, of the glucose fructose type situation. Um, the average American today has 81 grams of fructose. 
What's that do? Well, I do a lot of work with diabetes. There is a cure for diabetes, right? Well, guess what? Within two years of when they kind of put a lot of fructose onto the market, <clears throat> there was an outbreak of diabetes. So even though, I don't want to get too technical here, but even though it isn't directly, uh, you know, glucose, it actually disrupts the hormonal balance in the system and increases the rate of diabetes, of type 2 diabetes. So I'm not too hot on, on fruit, except the research shows there's been about eight studies. Bilberries, blueberries, and green apples do not seem to raise your blood sugar, whereas all the other fruits do. Okay, thank you for explaining. Um, and so now uh, I, um, I want to get back to yoga because I think it's very important that we talk about fitness and exercise when it comes to being healthy. Um, a lot of people on this channel, they're focused on what they're eating and that's important, obviously. But can you talk about your yoga practice? How long have you been doing yoga and what has it physically done for you besides, well, you're taller now than you were you know, 50 years ago, which is amazing. Um, what else has it done for you on a daily basis to be doing yoga? Well, my wife certainly enjoys it. <laughs> but, you know, because we do partner yoga too. But the the main thing for me, because I've been doing it actually for a, a long time, for more than 50 years, okay, is it opens up your energy fields, okay? You're, you're more expanded, your breath is deeper, and you're more flexible. Mostly with age, people get less flexible. And we know that. People you know, start to tighten up. And I can see it. If I'm not, I do yoga for, uh, you know, six days a week. And Shabbat, I don't do yoga, but so... But if I'm not doing it, if I'm doing a lot of traveling and this is it, I can feel a slight tightening. I can reverse that in a day or two. So, but there's a contraction that happens with age in general or with non-activity in general that makes your whole physical system contract. Now, what does that mean? Well, as we understand yoga a little bit deeper, uh, it opens up your, not just your aura, but your meridians and your chakra systems. And uh, so you're looser, you're more flexible, but you're actually stimulating the subtle body systems to optimize, I'm going to use a yoga term, or prana, the life force. So that's part of what the yoga is about. You know, I mean, I, again, I've been doing it since the early 70s, and there's no question about it. It increases your, your pranic life force, which is not what you people usually talk about when you talk about yoga. You're talking about you know, getting flexible. and All that's true, but it's way more than that. So that's how I how I look at it. This is a way, and, and, and I do the pranayama with it. It's just part of the practice. Okay, so, you know, I'll do the, it's not like you have to do excessive, but I would say 15 minutes of pranayama and a half hour of the, what we call Kali Ray Triyoga, which is what my wife teaches. She's a senior teacher in it. And that's good. That achieves the expansion versus the tendency with age of contraction. That's huge. Yes. Um, also, I have to tell you, I like to sit in full lotus and I like to do that. I, and if you don't do the yoga every day, you, it's really easy to get out of that, you know, to get tight. And yeah, absolutely. Only takes a few days and you're like, oh, what is this body? It's so like different, yeah. so stiff. And 
Yeah. And that people, you know, people always think I can't do yoga because I'm not flexible. But like, that's why we do yoga, because we're yeah. not flexible, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, it's more it like lightens you up. You become flexible emotionally, mentally and spiritually, not just physically. You know, I know some yoga is only focused on the physical, but we we see it. I see it as a much more multi-dimensional kind of effect. Yes, me too. When I'm doing balancing poses, it's uh, I'm thinking it's helping me balance, you know, and it's so like strengthening poses. They help you to strengthen your mind. Yeah, you're so right. It's a real mental game, too. So now I got some great questions from my audience. Um, you answered a few of them already just because you knew. You knew what the questions were, um, like organic. Somebody asked if you could talk about why organic is important. Um, but um, someone wanted to ask, hold on. Um, did you learn anything about food in medical school? This was an interesting question somebody asked. We had one 45-minute lecture at Columbia Medical School. And it was on a very esoteric uh, topic, uh, the Krebs cycle. And, and it's like, that's it. There was no yeah. understanding of any of that. Now, we did. I lived in, uh, so I went to Columbia Medical School, lived in Central Harlem. And we did a school health program that was very exciting. And, you know, we, we took over 600 kids in one week and did a kind of full workup. I had medical students coming from places and the doctors helping. And we were able to give a pretty good analysis of the overall situation. And we brought this program, this is food here, into half the schools in Central Harlem. And believe it or not, we had the support of the New York City Department of Health. Wow, that's amazing. So are you from New York? No, I'm from Chicago. Ah, okay, but you went to school in New York or did you study, you I spent some to, time? I went to Columbia Medical School in New York City and before that Amherst College in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Did you spend time in New York as a, as a raw foodist? Uh, I was in transition. You yes. Know, okay. It's pretty easy to be raw food in New York. Yes. In my experience, my daughter, granddaughters live there, and it's pretty easy. I don't have any trouble in New York. Yes, I'm from New York. That's why I asked. So, yeah. um, and it's very there's everything you want there, all the yeah. gourmet stuff, <laughs> anything you want. Super easy. Yeah. Yes. Um, so now someone asked, um, they would like to hear about the fundamental values you hold, which have kept you on the path for so long, and some insights regarding the future of the raw slash living food movement in general. This was a question from one of my followers. A great question. Um, I think people become vegan for a variety of reasons. What is also? A actually big reason. Uh, my reasons were more spiritual concerns, but um, but I would say that also about seventy percent of people become vegan for animal cruelty. You know, to prevent animal cruelty. That's the number one. Okay, and then we look at. Uh, um, for health reasons, environmental reasons, and spiritual reasons. <laughs> and that's pretty much the way it is. And, and basically, besides the animal cruelty, there's 45% for spiritual concerns, 53% for environmental concerns. So that's... Let's get to that in a second. So that's kind of a motivation. Mine was primarily spiritual, which is how to eat to become a superconductor of the divine. 
Mm, yes. And, you know, along with that, obviously you get stronger and you get, there are many benefits, but the primary benefit is merging with the divine. That's my focus. Yes. And for those of us who are on our spiritual journey or just starting out, um, what would you recommend for us to do or, um, you know, a step that we could take to start our, our journey, our practice? My because I have a multi-functional uh, approach I call it the six foundations I will roughly talk about it and then put it in perspective okay. the first eating to become a superconductor of the divine which is 100% vegan at least 80% live food second is to build prana or life force the spiritual dancing which you saw uh, the, the yoga different things pranayama, things like that. Third, service and charity. Because you want to make that heart connection with the rest of the world. Fourth, if people are ready, and not everybody's ready, working with some sort of spiritual teacher who has already fallen in all the holes so they know <laughs> the mistakes. Fifth is meditating uh, on a very regular basis. And six is uh, awakening the kundalini uh, spiritual energy or Ruach Kadesh. Now, that being said, as a kind of overview, the most important thing is you start with doing what you can do successfully and just go a little bit more than that because it's easy to get discouraged. Okay. So you always you just want to do a little bit more than the max. And then when you get to that place, add a little bit more. But you always want to take a step that allows you to be successful. So where people get in trouble is they get over their head, they get discouraged, and then they stop. So, and then good company. It's really good to have a teacher, friends, you know, people who are sharing with you so you 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 feel supported. It helps to have support. And so I think those are the two things is that don't do more than you can <laughs> don't do more than you can do and be successful at and then have the support of friends, teacher. Those yes. Those, that'd be my advice. Yes. Okay. So I will link I will leave links below so that um, you can help people on their journey through your programs and your books and support people through your community. And um, I have just one more question for you. Uh, this has been such an honor and I thank you so much for making time. I know it's late uh, there in Israel. And so I wanted it's, to ask you. Everything's perfect. I'm very happy. Very good. Thank good. you. So I wanted to ask um if you could share a message with every single person in this world across all nationalities and countries and ages, what is a message that you would love to share today um, with everyone? The, the most important thing we can do in our life is do what we love and what brings us closer to the divine. So it's living with your heart on fire for the divine, but in your own unique expression that can get deeper and deeper. That's the most important thing is to live with your heart on fire. And it's a way of life, obviously. It's, it's, a, it's like passion. I'm not talking sexual. I'm talking passion for life, passion for God, and living with that hearts on fire passion makes you really, really, really alive. And that is what's missing in today's world for many people. They're trying to make people feel hopeless and useless. No, we can live with passion no matter what is happening. And so I say keep the passion Keep the heart on fire 
And for me, God is the central point, you know, heart and fire for God. And then everything I do makes me more able to stay at that level and keep progressing. So I bless everybody that you feel that passion. And if you don't quite feel the passion, work on it. Feel the passion because we're naturally passionate beings. And let your soul be on fire for what you're doing. That would be my advice. Oh, that was beautiful. I think that is so important. So many people are stuck on survival mode. And that's why they are not reaching their breakthrough with their health or their spirituality, because we're not here to just survive. We're here to live with passion and um, dance like you when we're 80. I can't dance like you now. You know, I'm almost 40. So like, I got to get to work. I got to get to work. So thank you so much, Dr. Cousins. I really, really appreciate you. Um, thank you for your time. And like I said, everyone, check the links below so you can connect with him and uh, check out all of his amazing works. Um, and I highly recommend you check out his books as well. I'll leave them all below. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your interview. And may you be blessed to continue to inspire people in your life here. It's thank great. You so much. I love it. I'm happy thank you. to come get if you want because it's so important to get out to people yes thank you so much and um have a beautiful beautiful night thank you guys for watching and i'll see you in the next episode Take bye care. blessings to everyone don't forget <laughs> the bye so yes. odd. <laughs>